Thank you all for coming, and, and uh, Ralph is really class act, and he does a terrific job, and he's put a lot of cohesion into a lot of the uh, uh, disgruntled feelings that we felt with regards to the reason we're here today. And Senator Beavers, we're glad to see you here, too, and being great comments. And Doctor, thank you for your hard work, too. First of all, I want to uh, just tell you, I'm going to hit real quick on the high points of the tort reform bill that we passed this year. It's probably, it is hopefully the first step of several steps uh, in issues that we hope to deal with with regards to tort reform. It's important to remember that sometimes progress is made in baby steps, and that after a three or four year period, maybe we can look back and really see some, some true progress. The important thing is that at all times, we're all headed in the, in the right general direction, and we are making progress. So I'm pretty proud of the tort reform issues that we have been able to get done you have to keep in mind that for the first time in 150 years we've got a conservative general assembly conservative house conservative senate and we've got a republican governor we did, we accomplished about 10 different things this year that are all banner issues to have even gotten one amendment to one of those issues in the years previous that i've served would have been would have been a, a true benchmark but to get the number of things done that we actually got done in a shorter session than, than uh, I've experienced since I've been up there nine years, it really was a pleasure. And we did that under the leadership of Speaker Beth Harwell. And she has done a terrific job, and I've enjoyed serving with her. Let me start by saying that I'm not an attorney, even though I'm going to hit you with some of these high points on the tort reform. And uh, that, uh, first of all, we, we have to make the case for it a little bit. And that was the hardest thing, is, was to get the bully pulpit to be able to make the case for it. But we're losing between $700 billion and a trillion dollars a year in, in our health care system due to the fact that uh, our liability cannot be contained. We don't have any predictability out there in the marketplace for the doctors. A lot of this is due to extra and unnecessary medical tests, uh, most of them defensive. Uh, you physicians out here and those in the medical community know. Um, defensive medicine is costing us all a whole lot of money. The, the reason the doctors are doing this is because of the high rate of lawsuits that have been brought. Some frivolous, uh, some are not, but they are, the awards are way out of whack for some of the problems that have taken place. The, a recent survey in the American Medical Association reported that 93% of high-risk specialists, and this was in Pennsylvania, admitted to the practice of defensive medicine, and 83% in the state of Massachusetts did the same thing. The same survey showed that 25% of all imaging tests were ordered for defensive purposes and 38% in Massachusetts, 28% in Pennsylvania and 38% in Massachusetts. And uh, we didn't have the data exactly for Tennessee, but we trended the national data and we're confident we're very close to the same due to the fact that we had absolutely no caps on non-economic damages. And it really was a lottery here. We, we've seen uh, many trial lawyer associations flow through Tennessee preying on our medical industry. As we tighten it up, unfortunately, they're going to other states. We're glad they're out of Tennessee, but we want to warn those other states that they're headed that way. And the practice of defensive medicine has come uh, so commonplace, it's definitely sapping our health care system. And uh, our former law severely restricted our efforts to recruit physicians because there was no limit placed on potential liability. It's very difficult to start a business if you don't know what the parameters are that uh, you could be penalized for. And just in 2010, which this was a statistic for Tennessee that really was a driver for the reforms that we got done this year, personal injury cases rose 35%, the awards, which is an average of about $105,000 just in one year's time. And you can see why would anybody want to start a new practice in Tennessee if that was going to be the acceptable practice through the judiciary. Of course, it was time for us to act, and due to the fact that we have a conservative operating majority for the first time in 150 years, due to the fact that we had strong leadership, and it was a, uh, Governor Haslam uh, has to be handed the credit for driving this issue and for making sure that it was successful. It was one of his, his major issues, but we were able to pass this. And uh, this allows us to put those parameters in place that I talked about, that as you sit down with your insurance agencies and as you sit down with your business planners and your office managers if you want to expand if you want to hire you're going to be able to have some more predictability and on the economic front 
overall, the tort reforms, not just in the medical industry, uh, helped insulate many of you, but they also, in many other areas of manufacturing in our service economy, they're putting more predictability back in place. Now, the limits are still pretty high. I'd like to see them down around two hundred fifty or three hundred thousand dollars, which is the same where we, it, which is where we put government tort liability in most cases. I think if it's good enough for the government, it's definitely good enough for our citizens. And there's truly a double standard there that I hope to address in very soon in the General Assembly. Now, let me hit on some of the uh, major factors of tort reform. We enacted, we established, like I said, caps on non-economic damages and medical malpractice cases. We reinstated peer review protections that ex had existed for years, but due to a 2010 Supreme Court decision, they were held in jeopardy, but we solidified those again as, uh, as permissible practices. We now permit hospitals and medical staffs to extend their requirements to sign verbal orders up to 14 days after the order if a readback provision and documentation of the readback in the patient record is used. We established regulatory oversight of pain management clinics by the Department of Health with significant potential penalties for clinics and health care providers who ignore the law. We also, on a similar front with our war on methamphetamine, we, we instituted a real-time drug tracking database that uh, pharmacists are all required to use now, and it will help us in the pain management side. It would help us in the physician shopping side. Um, it would be much more difficult now not only to purchase the precursors for methamphetamine, which are ephedrine and pseudoephedrine, but it will also be much more difficult now to doctor shop and to fill a prescription at this pharmacy at 2, 2 p.m. and go across the street and fill a sim similar one uh, within a 30-day period. We standardized restrictive covenants for physicians, whether employed by a group medical practice or a hospital. We require all appropriate health care providers providing services in community-based settings to be more transparent about their licenses, their professional, capability of wearing a their professional capability of wearing a photo ID, and we ask that they supply a document to the patient that has their name and their professional title on it. So we want the person attending the patient to clearly identify themselves, whether they're a physician, physician's assistant, nurse practitioner, registered nurse, et cetera. Uh, so there's no, no confusion there. We authorize the Board of Medical Examiners working in collaboration with the Board of Nursing and Committee on Physician's Assistance to study and recommend a standard of care for hormone replacement therapy and for the promulgation of rules addressing any identified deficiencies in the oversight or delivery of such therapy. We supported the Tennessee Hospital Association in passage of the assessment fee that prevented the bulk of projected 10 care provider cuts, uh, also in the General Assembly this year. And we mitigated recommendations for initial 10 care provider cuts for delivery of C-sections and assessment of non-emergency conditions in the emergency room. All these were encapsulated in a pretty broad uh, spectrum of tort reform and medical reform issues in Tennessee. And I think it's just the, the truly is the beginning. The, the health care issue that's coming in 2014, Obamacare, uh, is going to be catastrophic to the state. Uh, Mr. Cunningham is exactly right. $1.4 billion to $3 billion in new taxes that are going to have to be generated by Tennesseans. This isn't federally shared money. This will be our portion of the new 10 care budget, basically. And it is, it's, it's insurmountable. It continues us on that trajectory that's unsustainable that we all know we're on. And their only way to fill that void in revenue would be a substantial income tax uh, on, on everyday earned income. Of course, we still have the whole income tax. I always like to make that qualifier. And we're, we're niching away at that. We actually increased your exemption for that this year, even though we had to make cuts in state government. And that's another thing we're going to continue to do. But we want to just uh, let me get on to illegal immigration so I don't kill my time here. The uh, E-Verify system we passed this year and it is not, once again, as strong as we want it to be. Next year, we're going to revisit it, and we'll continue to strengthen. And remember, I said baby steps. And it's very important to remember, as, as you're supporting us and we're supporting you, that we talk about let's, let's be happy with making progress every day just as long as we're making progress. Don't, let's, let's never be stagnant. Let's never be still. But let's understand that it may take three years to get something done and not necessarily six months. And that's what we're doing on a lot of our immigration issues. A lot of this is due to the, the subculture of our citizens and the subculture of many of our politicians, both on the state level and the local level. They're not, perhaps the education level is deficient and they don't necessarily know all the facts and figures. Maybe they're out of tune with 78% of Tennesseans and they're not voting the right way on, on immigration bills. These are the things we're overcoming as we're continuing to push this legislation forward. But the E-Verify legislation basically provides that an employer now will run a social security number or a 
immigrant ID number through Homeland Security's database and ascertain whether or not that person is legal or not. And proof that that check was made at the time of the hiring must be put in the employee file. And if it's not, then we can for the first time really go after employers with a pretty hard fine. Now, there was a lot of debate amongst my colleagues about whether or not we want to fine employees or employers. And the, and the answer unilaterally was no, absolutely not. But we're going to have to get somebody's attention in order to start curtailing this problem. And you know, we don't want to be the person that has to lower the boom on the first person that violates this law, but it's going to happen. We're going to have to get some folks' attention and start tightening this up. Uh, the SAVE Act was another piece of legislation that made it to the Budget Committee this year but was not funded. And that is basically, this is where we'll see some savings in TennCare, we'll see savings in social services that uh, Tennessee issues out, or we will at least be able to make sure, proof positive, that we have verified that those receiving these services are here legally. And we're going to, uh, we have the administration's uh, commitment that they're going to help us with that th next year uh, with the SAVE Act. And I know the Republican majority in the House and the Senate are very committed to passing the SAVE Act. An Arizona style immigration law also made it to the Budget Committee this year, but once again, we haven't passed it. It is one that I also think. We will be able to pass very soon. Uh, once again, it's an education issue. A lot of people weren't ready to accept the macro effects of this piece of legislation. Bottom line is we need it. We need more and more ways to be able to vet our citizens to make sure that they are here legally, that they're here voting legally, that they're here assuming our services legally, that they're paying their fair share of taxes. There's nothing, there's not a single member of the Tennessee General Assembly, whether they be male or female, Democrat or Republican, that I've ever heard say a negative thing about a single illegal immigrant. It's just what's fair is fair, what's ours is ours, and we want to protect it. And that's the bottom line. And the rest of the world doesn't allow people to walk all over them, and we don't want to either. In Tennessee, <laughs> Tennessee is, is not just joining a growing course of states, but they're leading a course of states in adopting new laws like this and, and reaching out, thinking outside the box passing things that are going to protect ourselves. Uh, we're reasserting the Tenth Amendment everywhere we can. We are telling the federal government that we have a balanced budget. We have our house in order. We have the lowest per capita debt in the country. We're doing very well in Tennessee. Don't drag us down with you. And as, as our federal... As our, uh, we hear from our federal legislators later this afternoon, you'll hear that we're, we're, we're communicating very well. We're trying to ensure that our federal legislators are passing enabling legislation in Washington, D.C. that's going to allow us to spend more of our money the way we want it spent. That doesn't mean we want more money. It means we want more control of our money. Right now, the federal government controls roughly 60 to 65 percent of the Tennessee state budget. It depends on what numbers you look at and how you look at them. That makes it very difficult for us to go in and be able to make changes without literally having two or three dollars for every dollar that we make a change in being withheld from us and threatened to be withheld or actually being withheld. And uh, when it comes right down to it, we have very, very little pride of authorship over our budget. Um, that's the first thing I learned when I got elected that was a true wake-up call that, that really we're not driving, we're co-pilots in our budget, and we need to be driving it. And uh, one of the things that this General Assembly now is committed to doing, and once again in baby steps, we're not going to be able to go from a 63 percent federally dominated budget to a 50 or 49 percent federal budget overnight. It's going to take some years, but we've got to head that way incrementally. Every single year we've got to do something new. Uh, two years ago we did it with our unemployment insurance fund. I know you as employers had to pay more money but we kept the federal government out of the fund. We don't owe them any money. We owe them no interest. They don't control the fund. We control it. But we did do something new that no Democrat administration did and no former committee did, and that is we put triggers in our unemployment insurance fund that once we reach traditional surpluses, then your fund, your, what you pay is going to automatically go down, and every six months it's going to adjust. So right now you pay on the first $9,000. If we get back up to traditional surpluses, which are in the $700 million range, which we're more than halfway there now, even this recessive economy, due to the fact that we're struggling out of this ourselves, you're, what you pay is going to drop. And we want to put more triggers like that in government to be able to have more elasticity so that government can contract or expand 3 to 5 percent as needed at the speed of business and not necessarily come in with a fix two years after too late. Thank you for everything you do. As a what you do for us. Remember, we work for you. We don't work for the state, the members of the General Assembly. 
And I do want to say one, one positive thing. My wife always jumps on me, or she doesn't anymore because I fixed this. <laughs> but, but I always, my job and, and Senator Beaver's job is really to fix the bad stuff. You know, in a, in a medical term, we're kind of the white blood cells of government. We go to the wound and we, you know, we fix it. So, so oftentimes we don't talk about the good stuff, but you live in a wonderful state. We're here by choice. And there are a thousand good things for every negative thing you hear in Tennessee. Never lose sight of that, even though we don't talk about it much. Thank you.